Hi, I'm Dr. Eric Westman, and this is the Keto Made Simple podcast. Well, so holiday season is upon us again, and uh, I wonder if anyone else thinks that years go by faster. And <laughs> I was reminded of how I got into this in the first place, uh, that two of my patients did this something to lose over 50 pounds each. And they um, told me they did, you know, the Atkins diet, or all I did is eat steak and eggs. And I was curious and didn't know much about it. One thing led to another. I ended up in Dr. Atkins' office in New York City and asking him for money to fund research. So for me, that was 25 years ago. And we've done research and, and used the diet in various uh, medical conditions ever since. So it was really Dr. Atkins who was open enough to actually invite me and my staff to New York City, which has was a, a learning experience for me. And, and that's what I do now is I get it up in front of a room of doctors and say, you're welcome to visit my clinic that's how I got into it. And there's so many barriers that make it so that doctors can't believe or, or you know, don't understand that often a visit to the office is necessary to overcome all of the, you know, I don't know, 20 different major barriers to thinking this is possible and people can do it and stick with it. And so I learned from my patients about this approach. I'm still learning. And uh, the reason I was reminded of this is that Gary Taubes has a new book coming out. If you haven't read any of Gary Taubes's works, they're phenomenal. You can go to, I think it's taubes.com uh, and, and find his list of, of reading of books that he's done. Um, Gary has a book on diabetes coming out in January. I've signed up to get it, uh, you know, as a pre-order at Amazon. And actually, I've been able to read the pre-publication version. So, again, I'm thankful for Gary, you know, to be able to let me read it ahead of time. And, and I hope I actually help shape the final product, I didn't get to see it, but there were lots of sort of milestones that happened along the way in the treatment of diabetes and how it got off track. And uh, so anyway, I, I, I'm thankful for other people teaching me, me, me being able to teach other people. And, and of course, the ultimate goal is to improve human, human health, your health. And um, so if you're, this is your first holiday coming through. Let's learn from each other. You know, that's what the membership's for. If this is your 25th holiday, like me, uh, and uh, uh, I still struggle with, I don't like that word, but I hear it all the time. I struggle with, you know, candies and, and certain foods that are around that uh, seem to just come out of the woodwork this uh, this time of year. So various strategies uh, were um, uh, uh, one of the things you can do, and it may, if this is your first holiday, you might want to just be totally strict and or abstinent of the carbs. And, and I say that just because early on, depending on how long you've done it, not eaten those carbs, they, they can derail you. They can get you off track. And I've seen some people do really well till Thanksgiving. And then, you know, um, you get off track. You, you, you thought you were going to do great. And, but then, you know, finally the, you did third day into the holiday weekend, you, you caved, you had some carbs, you're beating yourself up today. And, and I just want to get that out of your head. <laughs> you can have a holiday 
And and this is a strategy that kind of violates the, you know, strict uh, abstinence or nothing. It's sort of the the alcoholism, sugar addiction model. It violates it because if you if you truly are an alcoholic, you really should never have alcohol. That, it, but it's I think it's a different entity. The first time you go through the holidays, stay super strict. Or if you did slip, it's okay. You get back on track. If you ate some carbs over the holiday, you get back on track today. There's a whole month before Christmas or or Hanukkah or Kwanzaa or if you don't celebrate any of those things, again, carbs will come out of the woodwork. The psychologists get into this in a big way because if you give yourself permission to eat carbs, then you're not full of the shame and the guilt and the, the self-flagellation that can happen that's so easy to do. And, and so giving yourself permission to have some carbs on a holiday gets rid of that for most people. Now, not everyone. And and certainly there's a uh, element of, I wish I could have done better all the time. I, I uh, hear that so frequently, you know, uh, I lost 10 pounds over the month, but I could have done better. I, I had that one, one day I had carbs, you know, no, you do the best you can and progress, not perfection is really the mantra we have. And so, but, but, it, you know, if you can sail through Thanksgiving, you didn't have any carbs, fantastic. Uh, hopefully by now you've done it long enough so that the carbs aren't calling your name or, or tugging at you. It's almost like a, a magnetic pull, you know, it's, there's nothing physical, no string pulling you toward the, the food, but hopefully that has, faded and you've done it long enough so that you can be around the food without necessarily having it. Um, the other aspect of, of the holidays, other than choosing, you can choose to go off plan, get right back on. You can choose to stay on plan. That's your choice. The other aspect of that is that this happens all year round. So it's a strategy that happens during uh, birthdays, anniversaries, any kind of a celebration that you have a choice. You can give yourself permission to eat carbs, get right back on, or decide to not have them. Now, let's say you're faced with carbs, you decide you're gonna have them. My preference is that you minimize the damage. <laughs> In other words, have as little of them as you can I mean damage meaning yes the the carbs do cause inflammation and oxidative stress but you know it's not like a damage getting in a you know a car wreck or something it's not immediate like that but but so just a taste is another saying that we have where uh the calculation of it if you're just getting started, you know you haven't heard any of these sorts of details, and that's okay. That over time, I want you to understand that a teaspoon of sugar has five carbs, and you want to stay under twenty total carbs per day. A teaspoon of sugar has five total carbs. If on the holiday you had a teaspoon of sugar like even in your coffee or something, or just right from the spoon, you probably could stay in ketosis and stay on plan, even though it looks like you're violating the no sugar, because it's the amount that matters. Someone came to my office and the a doctor and was new to the whole practicing idea. And he said to me, you know, you teach people how to cheat. That's really weird. And I said, no, it's not. No, 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 no. But, so the ex false expectation is that there's perfection all the time. And no, I want you to understand the quantity of it. Although at first, yes, poison, don't have any, is a way to just try to keep you away from it at the beginning. But over time, the five carbs per teaspoon of sugar, that would then mean a teaspoon of pumpkin pie, apple pie, a teaspoon or, or forkful, 
couldn't have more than five carbs. And so there, if you decide to have carbs, you minimize them by not having more than a teaspoon or a forkful of any of the super high carb foods. So one strategy would be to, of course, hit the meat, poultry, fish, and shellfish, and eggs just as soon as you can, because those don't have any carbs at all. That's kind of my strategy is just, you know, meat roll-ups, deviled eggs, that sort of thing, uh, the charcuterie plate, the ham and cheese plate, uh, the uh, uh, filling up on that first is a great strategy. And then if you do have something that's high in carbs, you have no more than a spoonful of whatever it is. That even could be your kind of fallback if you you did well through, you know, last weekend, it was Sunday, you know, gosh, you did so well, but I just couldn't resist that whatever it was on Sunday, you did all that. Well, then you just, again, minimize the damage and have just a forkful or a spoonful. Remember, staying under 20 total carbs for the day, you're able to burn through all the sugars. We don't store sugar. We store fat. So you have to burn all the sugar and starch that you eat, and then your body will still give up the fat. And that, that fat is burned, and also some of that fat is turned into ketones, thus ketosis or the keto diet. But the ketones come from within. Um, alcohol is like, uh, 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 because it's really just pure energy, and it's a toxin, your liver will use up the alcohol as fuel. So it, it comes before the carbs even. So you could have some drinks over the holidays. And, and again, I'll come back to the five carb rule. Five carb rule meaning a typical drink, 12 ounce, uh, light, 12 ounce light beer, three or four inches of a wine, and that's a dry wine or, or a, a, another. Casey Durango calls it the restaurant pour, not the home pour of wine. So one or two glasses would be 10 carbs. So one glass, five. So one beer, one glass of wine, and then one or two hard liquor shots, sugar-free mixer. Tonic has sugar, so it has to be diet tonic. That is a way to count those drinks. Each drink has five carbs. So if you're in a, you know, really splurge, to me, this would be a splurge, is to have the you know, taste of pumpkin pie and and a beer or a wine, uh, one or two glasses, and then I can still stay on plan, meaning not going over the 20, if, using that hard 20 total grams per day. And, you know, on the days you drink or, or eat carbs, you may not want to have so many carbs at other other times. And that, that's where you get into the idea that maybe you don't have so many vegetables that day. <laughs> um, and, and I become more comfortable with the idea of not having plant matter, not having vegetables and things like that. Although the method we've studied and, and written about and used does include that two cups of leafy greens, two fistfuls and two uh, in one cup of a non-starchy vegetable for the day. I don't really enforce those as a necessary daily practice. Uh, the body will get all the nutrition it needs from that protein group, the meat, poultry, fish, and shellfish, and eggs. So now I guess you know some of the, the details of how to have some carbs if you find that you're having a taste and you can't stop, then it's too soon to do that. And again, if this is your first holiday season, if you if you if you're just sailing right through right now, just don't even try that that um, uh, just a taste yet. If you are going really well with uh, staying away from carbs. Um, so in my clinic, I see a range of, of what people do. I, I, early on, most people do stay super strict and just have total abstinence of carbs over the holidays, and they end up you know, losing 5 to 10 pounds over the time period when most people are gaining weight, and that feels really good in January. 
yeah, the idea of having to restart and having a, a New Year's resolution is is doesn't matter because you you haven't stopped. You've kept it th- going through the holidays. Um, so the idea of being super strict in the first maybe first few years or it really kind of depends on how your journey is you know i have some people who need to stay super strict for a couple of years before they hit their goal meaning they they have 100 or 150 200 pounds to lose um some people are able to every now and then meaning once a month have some carbs and then they're able to just get out of their system and then they they're great for the next month um what we've learned, though, through uh, small pilot studies that we've done is that some people, especially if you've had a long, lifelong history of trouble with weight and carbs, some people are knocked out of ketosis and don't really get back into weight loss for two weeks after they have some carbs. And so that would be pretty frustrating if you said, oh, well, I need some carbs to stay on plan, but and you had those carbs every two weeks, but that stopped your weight loss for two weeks, then that's not going to be working. So uh, the, that's why we are super strict about staying on plan, staying away from carbs, uh, you know, all the time. It, it's like a medicine you take every day for, for high blood pressure, a medicine you take every day. It's not so, like ibuprofen. You just take it every now and then or, or, uh, I mean, can you imagine going into your doctor and saying, doctor, can I just take that high blood pressure medicine six out of seven days? Or or, or can I just take it, you know, um, on Monday and, when, you know, anyway, during the weekdays? And, and no, you really have to take it all. You have to follow the diet all week, all month long if you're someone who has that tough kind of metabolism. So that's why we teach the very strict version for everyone to make sure that everyone gets uh, the results. Um, And uh, if you're going to slip, give yourself permission or or just minimize the damage. Um, What about if you're hosting a, the, the Thanksgiving meal or, or a holiday meal? That's fascinating because uh, I've learned that some people are just really, I don't know, they're they're susceptible to the peer pressure of their family, of their children or parents or or spouses or it's, and and yet some people aren't at all. Uh, Fascinating how that, that can work. So, but you can cook all the old carby things if you have family coming in and they expect all those carbs and just again minimize the amount that you have Uh, or you can ketify change some of the things into low carb uh, uh, versions Uh, have you tried lately the macaroni and cheese version of a cauliflower version of macaroni and cheese if you haven't found Linda's low carb website yet, Linda's low carb recipes and menus website, there's a really cool, um, popular version of a macaroni and cheese called maca phony and cheese. Yeah, maca like you know fake. She's got faux potatoes and maca phony and cheese. And it is a version of macaroni and cheese made with cauliflower. And then the cauliflower rice, of course, is the classic substitution that you uh, can look at some versions. You cook the whole cauliflower, pat it dry, and then you know, uh, food process it. Chef Scott, who um, put together our companion and your carb confusion cookbook, has a method of making cauliflower rice using a microwave. It might not be essential to do that uh, or uh, advantageous if you're taking a lot of time for cooking for the family or for the gathering. But cauliflower rice in the microwave uh, is like three minutes of cooking 
the cauliflower and you always use fresh cauliflower so that it doesn't come out runny. And sometimes the store-bought frozen uh, chopped cauliflower or broccoli comes out a little runny. Um, but uh, so using cauliflower as a substitution, of course, it could be raw, like a, 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 a um, raw veggie plate as well. Um, so cauliflower is a great vegetable to use to make substitutions. Some of the cookbook authors, not only uh, uh, Scott Parker with Andrew Carp Confusion, there are other cookbook authors who understand page four, and they are friends of mine through the years. Uh, uh, that's uh, uh, Christy Sullivan and Maria Emmerich. And yet the, they will go to great lengths to kind of recreate certain dishes. And, and if you really wanted to spend time coming up with your own versions of things, even you can learn how to make substitutions on your own. Christy Sullivan is actually a retired educator from the community college uh, down the street here in North Carolina, Sand Hills Community College. So there's always some sort of educational component to her cookbooks as well. Um, let's say you're going to someone else's house. Did anyone do that? Was it awkward? <laughs> do, uh, did you figure out how to navigate being elsewhere? Did you, were you able to bring a plate of deviled eggs? Everyone loves them and, and or some other keto friendly dish. That's a strategy just to make sure that there's something there. Uh, again, the little bit on your plate just to taste would be a strategy if you're at somebody else's house. Uh, and even then, you know, sometimes people tell me they had to have some of the, you know, the hostess's food. Otherwise, that would have been rude. Well, fine. You know, so you have a day where you're not doing it. Give yourself permission come back home and just get right back on plan. Have you had saboteurs yet? Have you had people saying, oh, just a little bit won't hurt? Uh, that is pretty common. And depending on where you are, yeah, a little bit can hurt. So you want to just be aware that some people have no understanding about how difficult this food and sugar and ultra processed food addiction can be some years ago it would have been common for someone to just uh, alcoholism really wasn't accepted or not well known so you'd be forcing alcohol on someone even if they were alcoholic. Now today, that would be very poor form. No one would really do that. It's not socially acceptable to push alcohol on someone who you know has a problem with alcoholism. They might have to tell you that, and then most people will respect that. That for sugar and ultra-processed food addiction, we're nowhere near that sort of, of understanding that some people have to be very careful. Some patients tell me they just say they have diabetes and they can't have it. Or my doctor says, I can't have that. Most people would respect that, uh, I think. Um, putting it into kind of a health framework, uh, even if you're out and about at someone else's house or, or at a party, that sort of thing. Um, uh but still, you're you're in charge, and um, how you respond, if you're out of control, realize that this is a addictive kind of process. You can get back in control by going back to the safe list of foods just for a day or two. Remember, the hunger goes away, and you will be back in control. The food won't be calling your name out. Um, I realize now I've probably said, um, 10 times. <laughs> I didn't realize that, that, and that we're putting these ALA private 
talks out on YouTube afterwards. So I, I had no idea that I, I thought it was a, a safe group for me to talk about the ums and erase that. But people came into my office right after that saying, you know, you're doing better now. You don't have as many ums. <laughs> so, and if you don't know what that is, good. I don't want you to know. Uh, no, I don't want you to know about that. Uh, well, so through the holiday, it gets better over time. Everyone's experience is, is different. Uh, I had to compartmentalize carbs personally so that I, I think the last vestige of just being totally out of control was for me on Easter, and I would have jelly beans. And that be totally out of, uh, you know, there's no stopping me from eating the whole thing of jelly beans. Today, that still is the case. I just don't go near them. Uh, I might contain myself to, I think you've heard me talk about Andy's mints. Andy's mints are, are mint chocolate that have individually wrapped little bars. So they're small. Again, that idea of having just a little bit. But again, the, this over the years, it's less tempting for me to have the whole box. Occasionally I will. Most of the time I just don't have it around the house. Same with peanut M&Ms for me and probably for you. You have a little bag of peanut M&Ms and you'll have two. You have the family one around, you'll eat the whole family bag of M&Ms. Or you might have a different, um, what's the word today, kryptonite that brings you down. Uh, but the, over time, what you want to do is minimize your exposure to that. No, don't have the candy jar at work with little mini good bars or whatever. Uh, I was at Halloween, a uh, neighbor uh I had some candy out. I said, well, I, you know, I like Butterfingers. And she looked at me and said, is that on the keto diet? And I said, well, it's a mini. It's a little one. And it's the only one I'm having. And so now whenever she sees me, she goes, she goes those Butterfingers, they're not on the keto diet. So, again, it depends how many carbs you've had that day. Can you stay to just a taste? Um, the five gram rule is a good one to keep in mind. And if you were in the medical world, if you were a health practitioner or if you had diabetes, I'd give you the other five gram rule uh, that's really important. And that is the entire amount of sugar in your bloodstream is five grams, which is, is really kind of shock. I don't know, shocking. I don't know why. We're not all diabetic, all affected by high blood glucose is because if you so if you poured out all the blood, most adults have about five liters of blood, and you multiply out the hundred milligrams per deciliter, and I and I'll do this to the students and residents who who just have half a day with me, and I'll, I'll make them go do the, you know, right now it's middle school math where you take the milligrams, how many thousand milligrams to a gram, 10 deciliters per per liter, and you cancel out the zeros and the, the, the milligrams cancel out, the liters cancel out, you're left with grams. And voila, you have five grams of glucose in your bloodstream at any given moment. So if you have diabetes and you have a taste of sugar or or the the whatever the the dessert or is, you're basically putting in your your body the same amount of sugar that's already in your bloodstream. And if that was all absorbed at one moment, you would double your blood sugar. Just a teaspoon of sugar. It's five five grams. So now when you're looking out and about at different products, the, of course, the best keto products don't have labels. And they really should say they should put on steak great for keto diet. 
man, I don't know why they haven't done that yet. In fact, someone came through my office who was kind of in that world, and I said, "You guys ought to do that." You know, it, now you know it might be too late if keto is is waning in popularity, but but uh, the idea of having five grams of any food or drink raising the blood glucose of course what's happening is the insulin goes up so that you don't have a doubling of your blood glucose although it might go from 100 to 150 and and that's you know half again as much uh, because insulin got up to put a lot of that sugar in before you absorbed all of it out of your stomach another way to think about the effect of glucose and how you when you eat or drink if you've never had diabetes we teach those with diabetes to rescue themselves with a low blood sugar by having some sugar. And it can be as little as 10 grams of sugar that they have with these two or three gluco tabs that are called, or a swig of, of Coca-Cola, uh, a, a teaspoon of peanut butter, and that raises their blood sugar from 50 or so, you know, to 100. So again, that just shows you the effect of a small amount of sugar on the bloodstream. We we tell people to have these two gluco tabs to bring up their blood sugar from being too low to being higher. Uh, so uh, that's just another example of how little glucose we have in the bloodstream at any given moment. And to me, that means we want to be very careful about how much we put in because the glucose and insulin uh, interplay is a major factor, if not the most important factor in terms of health for our arteries or for inflam inflammation, which then opens the door toward things like cancer and and uh, neurologic disease, autoimmunity, all those sorts of things. So be careful about the, the sugar going in. The starches get digested to sugar. That's why I teach total carbs so that the um, labels are consistent and I can teach it in a simple system to people from all walks of life or from all uh, uh, educational levels. Someone came into my office who, who uh, went through high school only, and by the end of the the time we had together, the person looked on the Coca Cola or Pepsi, one of those, and had forty one grams of total carbohydrate in that that can. I hadn't looked at one in so long. And so she knew even by the end of that first encounter that by teaching with different labels that you want to go for zero grams uh, for beverages or, or one or, or, or two, staying under 20 for the day, and you keep your body in nutritional ketosis. Well, I'm going to uh, open up for any questions that you might have. How, you know, how did Thanksgiving go? And you know, let's see if I can do the Brady Bunch uh, sort of uh, so I can see all you guys. Um, if anyone wants to unmute and, and take the stage. And oh, now that I told you that this gets sent out to YouTube, you probably don't want to do that. <laughs> uh, but Dr. Uh, Westman, I had a question. Um, sure. So. Thank you. I've been on this for about a year now, and I've lost 110 pounds, so I'm doing really well from a weight standpoint, but I went back to the doctor and got some labs done, and I know you said don't really check them in the midst of your weight loss, but my weight's pretty much plateaued over the last couple of months, and I was surprised that my lipids hadn't changed more, and I guess I just wanted to hear you comment on how long does it take to heal your metabolism from a you know, I went from 30 to 46 on my HDL. So, I mean, that's a 50% increase. That's pretty good. Yeah. But my triglycerides only went from 128 to 106, which 
I don't know. Is is that expected? Um, the one that worried me was I had a C-reactive protein a year ago that was 12, which was super high. And I thought that would be a lot better, but it was still eight. So obviously I've still got inflammation. There's a lot going on yet. Um, I don't know of any coronary artery disease that I have or any vascular disease. I plan to, I'm 55. I plan to get a CAC after the first of the year to just kind of confirm that. But um, in your experience, I mean, is this a two or three year process? Um, how, when would you expect like this, the C-reactive protein to normalize? Well, so there's no substitution for sitting down for a half hour in the office, taking time to see the things you've been through, other medicine and all that. So, so I'm going to take some shortcuts. And um, so if anyone's heard us talk about the vascular system before, the coronary artery calcium score is a way to check to see if there's calcification on the coronary arteries, the heart arteries. Lifeline Screening is a company that comes around and checks your neck and your aorta and also check an echocardiogram of the heart. I'm a big fan of having you do your own body inspection of your vascular system because doctors aren't doing that now. And, and uh, so for $150, you can get the lifeline screening uh, and then the coronary score uh, in our area went up from 350 to uh, 150 to 350 hundred dollar 350 dollars depends on where you are where where to get it that sort of thing um but what that is doing is taking you from the obsession about cholesterol in the blood which we're obsessing over because of the arteries so if you have no arterial damage and you're 55, why are you obsessing over this in the blood? Because by the, by now, you're an American, you would have had some sort of damage going on. So man, just as a, as a shortcut, what is your BMI still? Um, it's, it's not a perfect indicator, but... Right. So I was in the mid 40s when I started, and I think I'm about 31, 32 now. Yeah. So don't look at the cholesterol. <laughs> ah, I know. But so the reason for that, it's a little known, little known thing about uh, uh, metabolism from obesity medicine. So that's the field, uh, my second sub specialty, internal medicine, obesity medicine. And now keto medicine, I guess, is the third one. But the metabolism, it, 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 when you check something, you don't know where it's going, right? Yeah, and it may be slogging around and and, and the, the triglycerides going down is a good thing because that's a reflection of the fat being shuttled through the liver. And, and that's, uh, you know, but in fact, we're we're just getting the cholesterol course for Ayla put on an evergreen status. We're getting through that. It's not quite there, but if you really wanted to get into the weeds, <laughs> um, the the cholesterol course will teach you again that the data for obsessing about these numbers in the blood. It's pretty weak. It's pretty weak if you have no evidence of arterial disease. It's it's even weaker. So uh, I'm not worried about those numbers. In fact, you can rest assured if you're not eating carbs, you're cleaning up your metabolism as you're losing the weight. So fat burning is a is a healthful thing to have going on. So the in the short run, I guess the indicators could be that what's the glucose, insulin, A1C? Have those improved? So I didn't check my insulin. So I actually started this because I was I'm, I work in healthcare myself. So I recognized in myself a year ago that I had polydipsia, polyuria. I had um, 
some blurred vision. And I'm like, well, I know where this is going. So I went out and got a glucometer and I was in the 300s fasting. Never been diagnosed with diabetes and it's still not on my chart, but I guess now we're going to put it on YouTube. So hopefully the insurance company's not looking. <laughs> but at any rate, um, you know, and now my fasting is routinely in the 80s. And it came down within about two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's been it's been normal for over, almost a year now. Did you ever have an A1C measured when the blood sugars were in the 300? Yeah. No, because I just 12. did it myself. I didn't go to the doctor. <laughs> so it, just to translate this, it, it was probably 12 or 14 A1C percent. And normal is 5.5%. And people are coming in, the doctors in my area, if your A1C is six, they're starting to say, oh, prediabetes, better watch out, which is great. Of course, then the doctors don't know what to do. <laughs> we're, we're trying to teach that if you eat sugar, your blood sugar goes up. But, you know, doctors are just kind of hard to teach. In fact, I will, I'll ask, you know, what is diabetes? And the doctors come in, they go, well, it's when the insulin level and the pancreas. No, 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 no. What did the doctors check to diagnose you with diabetes? And, well, the A1C. No, no, no. What is the A1C reflective of? Uh, sugar? Yes. So diabetes is elevated blood sugar. And so Gaines, you, you recapitulated what doctors did 100 years ago which is if the glucose in the blood or the urine was high, they just cut all the carbs out. Sometimes they were hospitalized for that. The type ones probably were super sick. And, and the, the poly, you mentioned polyuria, that's the, you're urinating all the time, polydipsia, you're thirsty all the time. And the, uh, you know, you violated the guidelines. You were supposed to be on insulin. <laughs> we uh, published a few papers saying that in there and you know the guidelines are necessarily reactive and yet when you think about it if we're training physician assistants and nurse practitioners and, and even some doctors who aren't fully trained in all the pathophysiology we train them to follow guidelines and and that's kind of sad but Getting back to your your numbers and all the uh, HDL going up is going to continue to go up, and the reason that's kind of fallen out of the doctors uh, speaking about it is that there's no drug to improve it. In fact, the drug trials that were done to raise HDL they didn't work, and, and it's not that HDL shouldn't be elevated. It's just when you use a drug to elevate it, it's not doing the same thing as changing the diet to get an elevated HDL. So I, I think you're doing you're doing the right thing to to measure the the to inspect the arteries, which that's what we're all worried about. And it, you know it, the metaphor I use is it's just like when you're buying a house and you're getting a mortgage, the mortgage company makes you get an inspection. And because they're not going to give you a loan on a house that hasn't been inspected. And they're going to make sure that plumbing is good and the the, the all the, you know, you know, I have if you've had an, someone do a house inspection. So you could buy the house without an inspection if you purchased it with cash, right? There's no no requirement for you getting an inspection other than there's some a loan. So the, the bank it really owns you know really owns the house with the mortgage so so they're not going to trust you to know if the plumbing is fine which is really it kind of defies explanation that we would treat you you know for a disease that we don't even know you have and so the cholesterol elevated cholesterol is not a disease at best it's a predictor of atherosclerosis. And there's an interesting paper that I haven't been able to read. Uh, the American Heart Association apparently is coming out to endorse more metabolic syndrome as a root cause of something to target. But the there are always the guidelines that are 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 pharmacology or medication focused will always focus on things that can be improved by medication. 
and not give uh, attention to lifestyle. I mean, but that and it kind of makes sense to me now. It's the drug companies are funding all those things. They're going to want their their product marketed, you know. Uh, and it, yeah, it's not it's not right, or it's not the complete picture, or you know, just realize there's another way to go about it. So, um, so I wouldn't worry. Or take your worry and get that lifeline coronary score. Oh, the coronary score is it it can be a Pandora's box. I had a, a discussion with a patient who um was worried about a coronary score. So I explained, well, it's the, the calcium buildup could be because you healed the area of the artery. So calcium is there as a part of healing. It doesn't tell you the narrowing. And so the this fellow, like a lot of people, so the generic patient is shopping around. The cardiologists say, you know, your cholesterol's high. You have a coronary score that's high. We'll put you on a drug, put you on a statin drug. And I, I tried to explain, well, the calcium score doesn't tell you if you have narrowing. So, you know, I spent time and, you know, sent a bill to the insurance company for, you know, because I'm in the insurance system and coded it and and uh, said, well, you know, the way to really know is to get a CT angiogram. Now, the CT angiogram is, a, is like a coronary artery calcium score and that it involves radiation and a CT scan. You sit in the scanner, it, it's a longer test because it actually will tell you if you have narrowing in your coronary arteries, which is pretty amazing. But, you know, we can put someone on the moon, you would think we'd be able to measure some an artery that's just this far away, right? So uh, the... I guess motion artifact and you know the heart's moving like this. So you gotta so anyway, they figured out how to do it. You inject some dye, you do a CAT scan. But I told them your insurance company probably won't pay for it because the guidelines haven't caught up, you know, and the cardiologists are sort of in charge of the heart still, although family doctors and internists like me deal with people with hearts. <laughs> and you know, I send people to the that little institution, the Mayo Clinic, and have people look at the statin decision aid tool, the Mayo Clinic, and go through that with people and then send a bill to the insurance company. Uh, so, you know, that I had a long discussion with the, this patient and I, I said, well, you know what, let me order the test. I I hadn't done it here. Uh, you know, Duke, really, cardiologist reigns supreme. So I, but I thought, well, what the heck? Let's see if I can order it. So I ordered the test for him. And we called in and the insurance company won't pay for it. It's going to be $2,500 or so. He, in the meantime, goes to see another doctor, a cardiologist, who says, I wouldn't recommend that test. You have disease because of the coronary score, which is not not true. It doesn't tell you that. It, it doesn't tell you if you have, it tells you you have the disease, doesn't tell you if you have narrowing. And, but he said, and so I would just put you on a statin and, you know, let's not worry about doing that coronary CT angiogram. So I get an email back, text, uh, communication back. I don't want the testing. So, so basically, you know, I explain in a half hour what's happening, what's going on with the arteries, how you measure it. And, and you know, and I said in the, by email, I said, well, you know, is it worth $2,500 to know out of pocket whether you have coronary artery disease or not? Now, I, I knew this person because I spent an hour with them <laughs> talking about it. He could afford 2,500 bucks. I mean, you know, you're spending this on Starbucks, you know, or, or, you know, but there's a funny thing about our minds when we come to insurance not covering it and, and a whole field of 
cardiologists, internists saying you don't need it. You know, well, someone's making a decision for you. And and I wish everything was free. In fact, some of my friends who do what I do can't stand the idea that something can't be paid for. So they're outside the insurance system dealing with people who can pay for these things. They order the CT angiogram, they go and they get it, and they find out if they have it or not. It's not fair. It's not fair. So, you know, I'm, I'm educating, and, and, and all I'm doing is educating. And, you know, I, I didn't push getting the angiogram. I said, you know, if, if it's worth it for you, great. If it's not, and he decided not to. Now, if all I did was talk to people and educated them about this, and then they didn't do what I educated them about, yeah, that would be pretty frustrating. <laughs> but it's not like this is going on every, you know, every day. Uh, it's that is a kind of a rarity. But even the idea that you would treat someone based on that so if you're if you're the cardiologist and you're seeing so here's a hazard um, or or a, a just a cautionary note gains that if if you have coronary calcium and you go to a cardiologist they're going to say that's evidence you have the disease and we're going to put you on medicine even regardless of what your cholesterol is so well, and I guess the I'm violating one of my own rules, which is, you know, don't do a test unless it's going to change what, what you're you going to do. Yeah. And I already know I'm going to stick with this plan anyway. So, well, I, now if if it's zero, it, it can be very reassuring. Mm -hmm. But so that's the opening Pandora's box. If it's zero, the MESA study, which is a, a large study longitudinally uh, people over time, if you had a zero calcium score, is very unlikely for you to have a problem, heart problem over the next 10 years. There are papers written, and I, you know, if you don't know yet how to search PubMed, in fact, that's something I might show you sometime. It's amazing how you can find information now the the titles of papers have become descriptive of what their findings are, which is not the way it's supposed to be. You're, the paper's not supposed to say, you know, uh, we you know, here's the result that shouldn't be in the title. It should be given in the methods and then you decide for yourself. But anyway, the higher level journals don't let you say what the results are in the title, but the lower level ones, you know, uh, they're, they're a lot looser. Um, but anyway, let's, let's tell me, you know, over time, let us know what's going on. And uh, you might want to look into the Stall Slayer, Amy's book and course on what happens with stalls. And of course, uh, remember the weight loss is not a kind of a linear process. I think of it more as a stair step because there are times I, I, I have to imagine your your adipose cells are freaking out they they don't they're there to save you when the famine comes and and you're you're trying to you know it's like you're spending your retirement plan you're crazy you know so well and i have to say you know i'm i'm still losing it's just not okay. the three pounds a week that i was when i was a hundred pounds heavier i'm losing maybe a half a pound a week but i'm completely satisfied with that honestly if I didn't lose another pound, I feel so much better now yeah. than I did a year ago that Good. you've hooked me for life. <laughs> well, yeah, it's the method. <laughs> uh, well, um, let's see. I had lifeline screening, all was clear. Patty says, great, relieved because my lipids are high. Yeah, so cholesterol is not a disease. Joanne says, I'm 70, type 2, since 2001. Hmm. Not fixed yet, huh? Um, doctor checked my lipoprotein, said my small particle numbers were high, wants me on niacin. Would you recommend a coronary test? A1C is 5.5. Well, okay, no longer diabetic, uh, unless you're still on medication. Triglyceride to HDL ratio is one. So the triglyceride to HDL ratio is a, a way to figure out your insulin sensitivity or insulin resistance. That ratio is excellent. 
And the small particles, you know, again, uh, uh, that's kind of looking at the tea leaves of the blood. My evolution of looking at blood tests was, and you can look back, my first randomized trial that I did with low carb versus low fat, there was someone in the low carb group whose LDL went high. We took them out of the study. We were so worried. Yeah, this was published in 2004. Because at the time, I didn't know. Uh, I was still where a lot of the doctors are today. And so then I started doing the lipoprotein profiles, actually met the owner of the company that created the lipoprotein profile. And he gave me a heads up that, what are you doing? He said, I'm looking at drugs that improve insulin resistance and the change in your patients, or they were the research subjects, were like being put on a drug for insulin resistance. I told him, no, it was a low carb diet. So actually, so the, the guy who was checking the blood test for us saw that it was similar to the medication being treated for uh, insulin resistance, like metformin. It was a similar response. So I don't, so after watching the small LDL and some people never go away, and yet they were feeling fine, they don't have the atherosclerosis, I don't think, I think that's still in the old paradigm of looking at total and LDL, small LDL, and and it in some people it doesn't totally clean up. So again, like a high coronary score or a high LDL, a high small LDL is just another excuse for a doctor to put you on a medicine in in that way of thinking, in that paradigm. Let's see. Pat says, you're making me think I shouldn't get Oh, no point in getting a coronary artery score. I did lifeline screening. Right was no disease. Left was mild disease. Can you have narrowing without calcium in the artery? Yeah, well, so this is one of the problems with the method I'm teaching you. It's not perfect. Again, it's getting more information, but there's not perfect correlation of carotid and coronaries. And well, actually, so the coronary score it, let's say there's a normal distribution, that's that bell-shaped curve. If you have a zero, it's perfectly correlating that you're not going to have a problem. I mean, as best you can. Now, if you have a coronary score of a thousand, you have narrowing. So that's why I'm, I'm coming back off my bully pulpit a little bit that if the coronary score is super high, it does correlate really well with narrowing. The Pandora's box is most of the time you have it somewhere in this low range that doesn't tell you about the narrowing. So if you don't, uh, if you want to know more about the coronary artery calcium score in Jeff Gerber and uh, Ivor Cummins book, Eat Rich Live Long, I think it was, is, uh, they explain it, and, the, and also there's a movie called The Widowmaker. And the, so the whole idea of, of popularizing this, yes, there's a group in Miami, Dr. Agatston, doing coronary scores for a long time, but it really reached pop culture and in, in the keto-verse, keto internet, keto world, because a, a um, rich man had the coronary score. They looked and saw that it was at the area of the of what was called a widow maker. So you can actually see where the calcium is in the heart. And because of the location of the calcium and the amount that was there, they did another test and basically he had a, a narrowing. And this is a, a one reason for bypass surgery or intervention because it's called the widow maker is called that because if you have a clot or a, a, a occlusion, a blockage at that point, the whole left ventricle, the whole pump of the heart stops. And and basically, it's if, unless you're around medical care, you become, you know, you make your spouse a widow. So sudden cardiac death. So this 
rich guy gets it writes a movie the widowmaker and 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 it saved his life apparently i mean that can't really know without some sort of randomized trial but it you know uh, gave him a heads up that something was was lurking there they fixed it and he wanted to popularize the notion of getting a coronary artery calcium score so if uh so what happens is you're finding that these rare events rarely and the more common thing that you're finding is that we all have a little bit of calcium over time because of the healing going on so i don't know pat i think more information is i think good as long as you're not then kind of bullied into taking action about the information Uh, I, I think uh, if it comes out zero, it would be reassuring. Uh, and I'm still on that format. Okay. Well, with a uh, A1C of 5.5, and I'm, I'm not sure if you need metformin anymore. You know, doctors have trouble getting taking you off medicines. They don't have a class in medical school for that yet, unless they rotate through my office. <laughs> or geriatricians, I, I take that back. Geriatricians also de-prescribe. Uh, I, I share office space at Duke on the same hallway with geriatricians. And they deal, well, the average person has polypharmacy, meaning there's so many drugs that are being prescribed. They also take away medicine because uh, often there is memory loss, memory impairment, even statins can do that, or even uh, mild drugs that wouldn't affect younger people can affect the elderly and have side effects. So they do a lot of de-prescribing as well. Um, let's see. Um, HDL of 90. That's fantastic. <laughs> The it's funny, there's uh again, there's no drug that can raise your HDL. So, well, niacin, gym fibrosol, a little bit, and then exercise, doctors will tell you you can exercise and raise your HDL 10%. So that would take you from 60 to 66, you know, or 40 to 44, not 40 to 60, right? So Keep cut those carbs. <laughs> um, again, the uh, evergreen. Well, well, we're testing out the evergreen concept, meaning you could go to the Adapter Life Academy twenty four seven and purchase the cholesterol course. We're on the verge of having that. You know, traditionally we've only opened one course at a time so that we can devote all of our admin resources to that the people taking that course. But we, when we get enough people on a, a waiting list, we open it. We're, uh, it apparently, it's very difficult to set this up. I, I, you know, not being an internet guru, I'm like, come on, just do it. And it takes a long time. So... But that would give you more than you'd ever want to know about cholesterol. And the long story short, if you come to the office, I explain this. And then I go to the statin decision aid tool that the Mayo Clinic has put together. Put in your numbers. Comes up with pictures. What your risk is now. What your risk would be if you took a medicine for treatment. Of course. This is based on those who eat carbohydrates, which is always the apples and oranges comparison for just about every chronic medical condition that I see. Cutting carbs gives you an, an advantage so you don't have the same progression of disease as those carb eaters out there. And if you had a little bit of carbs over the holiday, just a little bit, you get right back on. Try substitutions. Remember these keto products. Just be careful. Look at total carbs. But more and more, there, there's some legitimately low-carb 
products coming out. I, I'm kind of impressed at first, favorably impressed. At first, I saw you know adding MCT oil with high carb made it keto. Like no, 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 no. But you need the first most important thing about a keto product is that the total carbs is low and then in the context of whatever else you're having for the day matters so if you're eating carbs and you add in a keto product that's not a keto diet right uh quick update so the society of metabolic health practitioners i'm on the board we're trying to teach people not doctors, not surgeons, not uh, they, you could be dietitian, you could be physical therapist, you could be a coach. The way I look at it is we're trying to teach relief workers how to go in and clean up a disaster, which is kind of our current chronic medical problems in uh, the Western world. So the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners has worked on several guidelines to support the use of low carb diets. It's a great group of people. I, I'm thinking of uh, toward the Boca meeting uh, next month. Uh, Boca Raton is the East Coast group meeting and, and it, it, it's um, appropriate for a lay audience or in, it is CME approved as well. And then their fall meeting is in San Diego. So that's called the uh, Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners Symposium. Um, and uh, the other main update is the textbook called Ketogenic. You could basically teach a course, a semester course, using this book. And it, while it focuses a lot on therapeutic carbohydrate reduction or restriction, it does have metabolism and it shows the shift in the cholesterol thinking as well. Uh, Dr. Nadir Ali and a group uh, put together that chapter. Blair O'Neill is a past president of the Canadian Cardiology Association. And he's written a few papers about the shift away from total and LDL cholesterol to triglyceride and HDL in the blood. But I, I think we can take it a little further in personalizing a decision for you based on whether the arterial system shows you have evidence of the disease or not. Well, I hope you have a wonderful holiday season. And uh, for our membership group on Wednesday, I'll be interviewing and hosting Georgia Ede, who's a psychiatrist who is using low carb and keto diets. If you have a strong interest in that, please join us on Wednesday at 8 p.m. and check out the videos from the Metabolic Mind Conference, which happened, I think, about 11 months ago because I just saw it up on my feed. The psychiatrists got together at a meeting, um, and uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing the latest. Things are rapidly changing in using low-carb and keto diets for mental health issues and even, even binge eating. So that'll be interesting to have an update with Georgia E E D E. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell, and check out AdapterLifeAcademy.com.